Hello and welcome to the Rock Bible Church. How y'all doing today? Good to see all these nice smiling faces out there this morning. Um, all, the, all the video stuff had to do with food, so you guys got to wait just a little bit. Lunch is still, you know, an hour away, but we're going to get there. And uh, before we get started, I, I do want to say a special thank you to Pastor Tyler, who filled in on very late notice last week. Um, I, I looked like a chipmunk, if you would have saw me earlier in the week. I looked really funnier than I normally do, and uh, it, I, I felt just terrible. I think there's only been three weekends, maybe in 20 years of preaching that I've ever missed church because of being sick, and last week was certainly uh, one of them. So give Tyler a big round of applause when you see him. And if you're a guest here today, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us. Would you put your hands together for all our guests one more time? We're so happy you're after the service coming up and say hello. We'd certainly love to meet you. Um, we do have a couple of events, as you saw, going on. I would reiterate the barbecue event that's going on out there because it's a great fundraiser for the kids. Um, I am a barbecue connoisseur, as you might notice. Um, I, I love barbecue. One of my, my, my uh, tells is if the ribs are good and you don't need to put anything on them, then, you know, then you know you've got good ribs. So how many of you, do you, do you remember uh, G's Barbecue? Did any of you like G's Barbecue? Um, the, the old G's barbecue, you know, the, I, I love going to the barbecue restaurants that are like j dingy, dirty. Those are the best tasted ones, but maybe that's why it burned down. I don't know. Um, but, uh, it, you know, last night, the family, we got to go to G's. They reopened in Stark. So if you're down for a little, like, little drive, they've changed the atmosphere completely. It was a wonderful night, and that is some award-winning barbecue there. But from what I hear, Jared and Jared, who are helping cook, can kind of trump what they got going on. So you might want to get some of the barbecue from here as well. So also that chili cook-off's coming up around the corner. I got a mean chili cook-off recipe, so we're going to get ready. Called Wendy's in Je Jesus' name, <laughs> uh, like, uh, but I can. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a great day as we baptize people and come for some fun for that as well. Uh, but today we're going to get into God's word from Acts chapter thirteen and verse forty-two in just a moment. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into God's word. Father, we do thank you for this day. We praise you and give you all the glory that is due your name. Yes, the songs that we sang earlier, what an ode to worship unto you, Lord God. May they change us and transform us and make us more like you. Today, as we gather together, would you remove all the distractions from the room? Whatever we might have been going through during the week, whatever's on our mind, would you set those things aside for just a few moments? So, Holy Spirit, so that you could speak. May I in no way be a distraction from your word today, but would you speak through me and touch the lives of each of us who are here, including myself, and change us where change is required, Lord God. We pray over these seats. For those who are here, Lord, set your people on fire. For those who are yet to be here, would we be a people who go out into the highways and the byways and attempt to reach them with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Lord, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. So church, I've spent almost every day this week praying this verse over you, Acts 1.8. It says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? Um, I don't know how many of you are going to be in like Jerusalem preaching next week. I don't know about you, but we have our Jerusalems in our own backyards and my heart is that God would give us a heart for the people who are far from him. And I think you're going to see that in today's scripture as we listen to some of the words of Paul. And Paul's just pouring out his heart for the Jewish people. And he's like, I long that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so much so that I would abandon my own salvation to see them be in a relationship with him. Would God give us that kind of a heart for our kin, for our, the people that are part of our families and our close circles and relationships? We're going to kick off today in Acts 13, 42. It says, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Man, this is every pastor's dream. He gets up there and preaches, and then, like, he don't even have to put the word out. All of a sudden, like, Lord, would you just come back next week and start preaching again? Hallelujah. For some reason, that never happened in my life. I don't know, I don't know why that didn't happen. And after the meeting, the synagogue broke up. Many Jews, devout converts to Judaism, 
followed Paul and Barnabas, the devout people. They heard the word of the God. It impacted them when they spoke to them. It urged them to continue on in the grace of the Lord. And the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. You know, God's word is sufficient. When God's word is preached, it changes lives. Man, would we allow him to work through us to see revival like this happen? Oh, my goodness. I don't know about you, but every church I've ever been a part of, we have prayed for revival, right? Lord, would you change our city? Do you know where revival starts? And you, <laughs> and in me, right? And each of us is where it begins. But man, I long to see those kinds of days where you can't keep people away from the walls of the church. They're so hungry to see and know God that they just show up regardless of who's preaching, regardless of what band is playing. Man, they could fill the stadiums up with those singers out there. Could we fill the stadiums up with people who love Jesus with all their heart, strength, soul, and mind? Lord, we long to see that kind of revival. But even in the midst of revival, they're scoffers, right? So one of the patterns that we've talked about that you're going to see repeated here and really repeated again as they move from this city into another city called Iconium next week is the, that Paul and, and Barnabas and his team would go into these cities. They'd find the nearest synagogue, right? They'd go in there. They'd start preaching to the Jewish people. Some of the devout people would get saved. Some of the unsaved people, not unsaved people, but like, you know, secular people would get saved. The non-Jewish people would get saved. Then there'd be a group of people who didn't like that people's lives are being changed for the good. Mind blown, right? How do they not like that people's minds are, and lives are being changed for the good? They would get upset. They would get angry. And as you'll see next week, they want to literally stone him to death and run them out of the city. And then they would run to the next city unscathed, so to speak, unafraid, and go out there and preach the gospel again. Some would reject the gospel. Others would receive the gospel. And oh, what glory it is when someone receives the gospel. Not our glory, but his glory. It makes all the pain worth it, all the rejection worth it, right? I don't know about you, but there's been a few times I shared the gospel with people and they were like, nah, I'm not believing that stuff, right? It could be discouraging. They didn't stone me. Thank you, Jesus. And not the kind of stone that's on the ballot this month uh, with the, the thing number three. It's not what I'm talking about for all you young people. I'm talking about real physical attempts to stone somebody, right? Revival, Lord, we long for it. It's exactly what we want to see in our generation. Acts 13, 45, the scoffers arise. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, the Jew, since you must thrust aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. There's a clear turning point in scripture here. Um, one of the things we're going to examine today is this a once and for all time distinct turning away from the Jewish people. Um, I think not, as you're going to see through Scripture in just a moment. But there certainly is a new age, which we call the church age, that's being ushered in in this moment, where God's primary attention is turning on the non-Jewish people, saying, hey, I'm offering in and ushering in with my coming this season of grace with the hope that all of you, all of us, would come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, right? Does that mean he abandoned the Jewish people, which is called replacement theology? No, I'll give you some uh, evidence of that in just a moment. But we're clearly and distinctly in this season right now that's called the church age, which we'll dive into a little bit deeper as well. But one day, guess what? The church age is going to come to an end. If the church age is characterized by grace, which it is, may we not take that grace for granted. Amen, right? One day, it says in Scripture, when Jesus returns, then guess what? That grace is going to turn to judgment at that particular day, and none of us want to face the eternal judgment of the living God, right? So what is this stuff that we're talking about here in Scripture, this turning away? What is the church age versus replacement theology? What do people believe, if you've never heard of these two terms, and maybe examine a little bit more so that we could just understand a little bit better about what some different people believe? So I believe by reading Scripture, and hopefully you'll see so today, that this shift away from the Jewish people was not absolute or permanent as replacement theologists would believe, right? 
that God has never forgotten the Jewish people. He still loves the Jewish people. They're still, in many ways, the apple of God's eye. His hand has been upon them in difficult times and in good times throughout every single generation. There's a remnant of the Jewish people who are Messianic believers in Jesus Christ who love Jesus with all their heart, strength, soul, and mind. You don't have to support all that Israel does to know that God's hand is still upon his people. Guess what? There's bad people in every single culture. Have you ever noticed that, right? Every single culture has bad people. Every single culture has good people, right? But God's hand remains upon them. You can see his divine intervention time and time again in the life of the Jewish people. His protection is upon them. As we approach the end days, just as it was in the beginning, God wants to knit Jew and Gentile alike into one new man, is what we're going to see here in Scripture. So there is a certain portion of Christians that believe in what's called replacement theology, a covenantal shift. They would argue that with the first coming of Jesus Christ, the new covenant the new covenant completely superseded the old covenant and made Israel obsolete, meaning that the church now holds all the spiritual blessings and promises that were originally given to Israel. I would say we do hold the promises of what he was given to Israel, but that doesn't mean he completely abandoned them either, as we're seeing Paul, the one who's preaching, but Luke telling us about it in the book of Acts. We're going to dive into Romans for just a few moments to hear the very words of Paul on this very subject that should negate any uh, false truths that replacement theologists believe. I can assure you that it has never been God's heart to completely abandon his people and that, yes, there is a remnant of Jews even unto our generation. If you look at Romans 9, 10, and 11, let me share a few scriptures with you. Romans 9, 11. I tell you the truth in Christ, and I am not lying. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren and countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service to God, and the promises of whom the Father and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Do you hear his heart? I prayed in the beginning that God would give us that kind of a heart. He says, I would even abandon my salvation and call myself accursed if the Jewish people would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Could we feel the same about our people, our background, wherever we came from, right? I love the beauty that in America is a melting pot of all different backgrounds and all different peoples. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. At the same time, we lost some of the things that like the Jewish people had. They had this heritage of one generation after another where they could say so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, and they could trace their lineage all the way back. And he's saying, I love my people, and I wish that they would come to know Jesus, right? I don't know who your people are, but I pray that we would have that kind of love for them, right? Some of you are like Gators fans or Georgia fans inside of here, right? Would we have that longing for the Georgia fans that they would come to know Jesus, right? (laughs) However you identify. I don't know how you identify, but um, I don't know the best analogy for that because I, I don't have that like culture like I'm I'm a half breed of like Italians and Jewish people and you name it I'm all kind I'm a mutt come on Jesus right (laughs) I mean so I don't have that thing you know but would he give us that thing for whoever it is that's that people group that we would long to see come to know Jesus with all our heart strength soul and mind right in Romans 10 1 he says brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved He reminds us in verse 11 of Romans chapter 11 that their rejection is not total. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them unto jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. I love that saying. If you go to Israel or you communicate with Messianic Jewish believers, um, they use that particular phrase often, that we, the Gentiles, would live such a life in Christ that it would provoke them unto jealousy. 
if I would give you a couple of analogies here, in AA, there's a phrase, I think I've used it once here since I've been here, it says, if you want what we have, you will go to any length to get it. Let that sink in for a moment and personalize it. I'll say it again. If you want what we have, you will go to any length to get it. What does that mean? So um, in AA or in recovery circles, there's generally a few types of people. There's the white knuckle people. And what that means is like you're not using, but you're like, I, I, I want to use today. I want to drink. I want to keep doing it. They white knuckle it and they abstain from their sin. They abstain from the alcohol. They abstain from that substance that they might be using, but they hate the fact that they're abstaining and they're going like, oh, I want to do it. And they're unchanged and they're mean. And they're some of the most nasty people they ever met. Have you ever met an alcoholic who can't drink? I mean, like ah, bad, like it's not good, right? Um, have you met Christians like that? Sadly, right? We as Christians, we hold something far deeper but I, I've met a lot of Christians who need to turn that frown upside down in Jesus' name, right? Like, if you want what we have, I don't want that kind of miserable that I see in your life. Like, shit. Now, they're all allowed seasons, amen, right? There's seasons where we're going through pain. There's seasons of difficulty. There's seasons of challenge. But if your life is characterized by being negative Nancy or so-and-so, where people look at you and they're like, Time to run. So-and-so's coming into the room, and you're a believer. There's something wrong with your faith. It hasn't gotten deep enough to begin to transform your outsides. Come on, Jesus, right? I'm saved. I'm happy. I'm joyous. You're free, but your face ain't saying that, right? Like, in AA, on the other hand, the opposite of the white-knuckle alcoholic would be uh, the ideal or the promise is that one day you would be happy, joyous, and free. How many of you like to hang around happy, joyous, and free people more than you like to hang around miserable people, right? Could we internalize it for even a moment? Where are you at in that, to be honest? Maybe it stings just a little bit, like you walk around a lot more negative than you really should be all the time. Hey, guess what? You got to be friendly to make friends. Hallelujah, Jesus. Would it change us if so? Because why would somebody want your Christianity if you're walking around negative all the time? Man, if you're happy, joyous, and free, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit in all of your life, then, then when somebody else's life gets difficult, they're going to look at you and be like, wow, man, I want what you have. I think of um, a lot of modern-day influencers and what's brought many of them to the top of Instagram and social media and other things of that nature. A lot of them flaunt all the stuff that they have, the worldly things that they have. They flaunt the Rolexes. They flaunt the Lamborghinis. They flaunt all the cars. They flaunt their houses. They go out there and they spend all the money in the private jets. And guess what? If you do that, you will get a big following online really quick. That's not what I'm talking about here when I say if you want what we have, you will go to any link to get it. I'm talking about the kind of life that I remember my Aunt Jeannie living. I think I shared about her one time here as well, but Aunt Jeannie was one of the first genuine Christians that I ever really felt that I met in my life. And, and we would go to Aunt Jeannie's house every Christmas Eve for a family dinner. Everybody would go there for a big Christmas party. Y'all getting ready for the Christmas Eve, Eve services, I hope. We're going to have some cards to start to give out here. It's always a big occasion. It's a wonderful opportunity to invite people to church, invite people to, to, to Christ. And I, I bet now, thinking back, I wonder if my Aunt Jeannie actually invited my parents to go to the service before going to the house. Uh, but what happened is we would always go to the house and then I'd get there, and it would be like kind of odd because Aunt Jeannie, who's hosting the night, would not be at the house for the Christmas party. And I'm like, this is kind of weird. But it showed me something devout because they'd say, where's Jeannie? And she'd be like, oh, they're at Christmas service. Ain't nothing impeding them. They're going to Christmas service before they come to the party, right? And then she would come to the party, and then you would experience this woman of God that was like glowing that you were like, man, I don't know. I haven't met too many Christians but man, if there's a Christian, that, that's what I would imagine them being, you know? It wasn't just the fact that she was devout, but there was something in her very being that was like, man, something about Aunt Jeannie that I just want to learn more. She didn't have to barely say anything. You, you wanted what she had. Even as an unbeliever, there was a provocation unto jealousy, so to speak, of the way that she was living. That's how God calls us to live, and I fall very short of that in my life, but I pray God would impart more of that into each of our lives today, that people would look at us and be jealous, not for the things that we have, but for the relationship with whom we have it, right? 
that God would see something in us and say, that they would see something of God in us and be like, man, I want to know him more. So what is this church age? I hinted at it earlier. An age of grace characterized by God expanding, not overriding his covenant to Israel to include the salvation of the entire world. You look at Romans chapter 9, those same set of verses. Paul himself expounds on it yet again. He says, as he says, also in Hosea, referring to the Old Testament, tying the two together, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. You and I, non-Jewish people, welcomed into the family of God, grafted in, Romans 11, 19. You will say to them, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. You and I are adopted into the family of God. He's making room for us in the tree of life. We're once living in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They break some trees off over here so that we can come and expand them more. You ever done that? My wife's in the garden, and boy, she starts cutting some stuff, and then all of a sudden, poof, they start going more to the side. And that's what God's talking about here, this pruning process so that more people could come to know him. Would we never forget these things? Would it get deep within us? Would we be fired up about what God's doing inside of our lives? Don't let the devil kick you down and keep you down. Remind them of who God is in your life, right? You are a son or daughter of the living God. Ephesians 2.14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of salvation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law and the commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both unto God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he preached peace to you who were far off and to you who were near, for through him we both have access to one spirit, to the Father, through one spirit to the Father. This concept of one new man, what does that mean? One new man. It means Jew and Gentile alike in Christ, the one new man. So what happened is in the early days, this is that moment where that switch is starting to go off. Salvation was given unto the Jews, right? And then now he's saying, guess what? The Gentiles are welcomed into this family. You get them grafted together. We become one new man in Christ. So it was in the beginning when Christ first came, he starts to turn his attention to this age of grace. So it will be again at the end before Christ returns. What do I mean by that? God is looking for and longing to see that one new man coming together again. And when it does, when we see Jew and Gentile alive in Christ, when you start to see a bunch of Jewish people starting to get saved and surrendering their life to Messiah and believing in him as their Lord and King, and one new man comes together in Christ again, then Jesus will return, not for grace this time, but to bring judgment, right? It'll be that final time that he will return. And it's happening probably in our lifetime. We're witnessing this comeback together, the rebirth of Israel. This very week, it's in the news again. This small little country remains in the news time and time again. Why? Because God's eye is upon it, and the whole world is upon it. And I don't know, there's not a large Jewish community here in in Middleburg and the surrounding areas per se, but we need a heart for the Jewish people. We need a heart for the Jewish people. We also need a heart for our people, right, right? that we would go out there and see all get saved, but that one new man would come together again, and then Christ will return. How amazing is that? Amen? Turning back to the book of Acts, 1347. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, and you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and, had, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The Gentiles in the crowd got it. 
they repented, they rejoiced, they believed. In our own generation, we're called to live that out every single day, the verses that we've been talking about. But here's part of my fear for our, our day and age. I think even in their age, he talked about these devout Jews who were in the synagogue who ultimately got saved, these Pharisees, these Sadducees who were there, right? And then there's other ends of the spectrum, even in Jewish life back then, that were very secular and far from God and didn't have very, barely anything to do with religion at all. Um, in our own day, from the churches, right, don't churches tend to vacillate between legalism and way too much freedom and grace, right? Or seeker sensitivity on the other side would be kind of the two, two parallels. And maybe somewhere in the middle between them is that place that we land where the gospel is sufficient, right? So on one end, you've got churches that will preach um, legalism and you got to do this and it's a set of rules and you got to do that and you got to do that and maybe some of us grew up in those kind of churches and then oftentimes we rebel as a result of growing up in that kind of a church culture right they put people into bondage there's one church breathing life and it doesn't have anything to do with denominations you have one you know say baptist church that's a life-giving baptist church breathing life into the community another one that's putting people into bondage every single denomination suffers from this in one way shape or degree or another then on the other end of the spectrum you get into, I remember one of the ones that just stuck in my crawl. There was a church that um, was when, when big flat screen TVs were just coming out and starting to be a thing. Now you could go to Walmart and buy it for like 199 bucks. But I mean, they were, they, were, they were just coming out. They did it. And this church was doing all these message series. And their big invite was, if you come, if you're a first time guest, we're going to put your name in the hat so that you can win a full flat screen 55 inch television. I'm like, is that what we've really brought the gospel to? Come for a giveaway so that you could win a television? I mean, does, does Christ really need that? <laughs> I don't know. You know, like that, that just seemed a little bit crazy for me. So there was a whole swing even in the, the, the 80s, the 90s of seeker-sensitive Christianity. And a lot of us came out of that. And, and we did everything that we could to dumb down. You don't want to offend anybody so that they can come to church. And what they found is it didn't make a whole lot of disciples. It made some very large churches but society remained unchanged. We didn't see the kind of revival that we're talking about here where cities are changed and people are longing to come back to hear the gospel. So I believe the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? That man, if we preach the gospel from this stage as has been the history of this church, that you preach the gospel plainly and openly that God will use that to transform lives, and that, man, we can be a people who are fired up, who are excited, who are in love with God, not in some kind of a fake way, but that, man, we have the spirit of the living God at work within us that will be so attractive that will draw other people to begin to ask you questions. That's the kind of prayer that I have for the people of the Rock Bible Church. Can I get an amen to that one? Hallelujah. God, you are good. I think most churches start with the right intentions, but many times... Sadly, the Holy Spirit has left the building, <laughs> right? May it not be so. Might we be quick to pray for those who are caught in that legalist camp? May we be quick to pray for those gone just a little too far on the seeker-sensitive side? May we be quick to repent ourselves when we find ourselves caught in the middle of that, amen? One of the things I love about a couple of the verses that we read, I know is verse 48 and one of the other ones, God loves us enough that he saved both the legalists that were there, right? And then he saved those who were really far from God on the other side. He saved both. So if you're a legalist in here, there's hope for you yet. Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> if you're going too far in the other direction, there's hope for you yet in Jesus, right? But man, I, I love it when both get saved. Man, I, I love it when people who are far from God get saved. I mean, I just, I'm amazed by what God does in their life. Some of you were that too far from God to get saved person, right? And, I, and when you meet people like that, then they just get fired up for God because those who have been forgiven much love much and they just go for it. I mean, they go out there and they don't care what people think and they just share the gospel with all their heart, strength, soul, and mind. Man, would we all get a little bit of that, even those of us who are a little bit more melancholy, even those of us who are a little bit more reserved, would God give us a little bit of that passion to continue to just live it out? And would we look for divine appointments, even when we're not expecting them? See, one of my great friends, Smiley's in the back today, and uh, I was training at his gym about a week ago, 
and there was a young man who after the, the, the training comes up and he says, are you, what did he call me, Rob? Or, uh, <laughs> he called me Rob afterwards. He, he said, are you Rob? No, I'm, I'm, past, I'm Eric. He goes, are you like helping pastor at some church right now that's the rock over there? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, well, I, I go to work with fat. And uh, he keeps inviting me to church all the time, you know, he said. <laughs> and, you know, He's just got that kind of spirit that's like, you, you want to be around him, don't you? I mean, he's always fired up. He's always excited. He's always loving. I don't know why the guy hasn't come to church yet. Maybe I got to get him in a headlock or something. But I mean, like, so, you know, it, it was one of those divine appointments. So I said, maybe you should listen to him and go to church. You know, like, I'll show up. I'll be there. You'll be comfortable. Like, we won't, you won't be around, you know, crazy people or anything. It'll be fun. You, you can come. So, you know, we can intentionally pray for young men like him, right? Would you pray for those divine connections that God would put people in your path in the most random of places that you would just bump into somebody and have that opportunity to be a light unto them with the hope that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Watch what ends up happening. Acts 13, 49. It says, the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, right? It can be disappointing if you share your faith and then someone does not respond. It could be, you know, a discouragement like that might, the devil might want to use to prevent you from continuing to share your faith with others. But I want to encourage you to keep doing it because he's going to put someone in front of you who's just there at that right moment where they're going to come to know Jesus. And man, you are going to get to rejoice with them. Man, someone that you might invite Christmas Eve that you're going to have show up with you or someone that you're going to invite to come on any of the weekend services and they give their life to the Lord. It's not you that gets the glory. It's him that gets the glory. But you get to rejoice as you see their life changed and transformed. They were once living this way and now God's got a hold of them and all of a sudden they're living different. So the disciples rejoiced in those moments. They rejoiced in persecution, right? We're living in a day and age where it's coming more and more and more. We're seeing that. We're witnessing it more and more in our generation. What that should spur us on to do is not shut up, which they try to do. It should cause us to talk all the more, to share all the more, to live a life that makes them jealous, a life that makes them long to have the kind of relationship that we have with our God, that they would say, man, I need that in my life, right? Lord, give us that kind of passion and anointing, amen? As they go from there, the next city they enter into is Iconium. And Iconium, guess what happens? Anybody want to guess? They walk into the synagogue. They preach the good news. Some of the Jews get saved. Some of the Gentiles get saved. Some people get mad at them. They're doing signs and wonders, and people are being delivered, healed, and set free. Somehow people get mad because miracles are happening. I don't know. Again, I'm just blown away by that. Miracles are happening. People are getting healed, delivered, set free. And guess what they want to do? They literally start stoning them in the next city that they go to. So if you want to hear more about that, come back next week. We're going to pick up on that next week. Hallelujah. Let me conclude with one more verse from... Romans chapter 10, since we've been lingering over there just a little today. The purpose of all of it is that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there will be no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jew and Gentile, once again, one in Christ Jesus. I suspect most of us in this room have made that confession, right? And if that's the truth, Lord, would you transform our hearts and cause us to look like you, walk like you, talk like you, act like you, and continue to share the good news with the hope that those we love would never find themselves in a place called hell, but would join us at the gates of heaven as we walk in to meet you, greeted by you, ready to worship you, and enter into this beautiful, loving, eternal relationship with our God and King. 
But if you've never experienced that before and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus before, I pray that you would do so right here, right now, today. I'm going to ask the band to come back up to the front. We're going to sing one more song of worship. And as they do, contemplate where you're at. Have you been a little bit miserable lately as a Christian? And again, everybody's allowed a season, right? We've got a season. But if it's gone past a season, would the Lord do something in your heart right now to remove that pain from you, remove whatever it is that's keeping you in that state of miserable? Because guess what? God doesn't want you to be miserable. He wants you to be happy, joyous, and free. You're alive in him. Christ is at work in your heart and mind. Don't let the devil keep you tied up. Don't let the lies keep you bound up. God wants to deliver you this morning and set you free. Maybe for some of you, that is that first moment where you're going to pray a prayer. Like was said right there, Lord, I believe you with all my heart, strength, soul, and mind. I repent this very moment. I leave my sins at your feet. And from this moment forward, I will live for you and serve you. You are my God and King. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. If you pray a prayer like that, I'd ask you to come on up and talk to one of us because we'd love to give you some resources to help you start your walk of faith off in a great way where you could grow and live for him and serve him and make the unbelieving world jealous with the hope that they too would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Would you rise with me for one more song of worship today? Thank you.